Let's remove quaternions from every 3D engine. To represent 3D rotations, graphics programmers use quaternions. However, quaternions are taught at face value. We just accept their odd multiplication tables and other arcane definitions and use them as black boxes that rotate vectors in the ways we want. Why does i squared equal j squared equal k squared equals negative 1 and i times j equals k? Why do we take a vector and upgrade it to an imaginary vector in order to transform it? Personally, I've always found it important to actually understand the things I'm using. I remember learning about cross products and quaternions and being confused about why they worked this way, but nobody talked about it. Later on, I learned about geometric algebra and suddenly I could see that the questions I had were legitimate and everything became so much clearer. In geometric algebra, there is a way to represent rotations called a rotor that generalizes quaternions in 3D and complex numbers in 2D and even works in any number of dimensions. 3D rotors are in a sense the true form of quaternions, or in other words, quaternions are an obfuscated version of rotors. They are equivalent in that they have the same number of components, their API is the same, they are as efficient, they are good for interpolation and avoiding gimbal lock, etc. In fact, they are isomorphic, so it is possible to do some math to turn a rotor into a quaternion, but doing so makes them less general and less intuitive, and loses extra capabilities. But instead of defining quaternions out of nowhere, and trying to explain how they work retroactively, it is possible to explain rotors almost entirely from scratch. This obviously takes more time, but I find it is very much worth it, because it makes them much easier to understand. For example, quaternions are introduced as this mysterious four-dimensional object. But why introduce a fourth dimension of space to visualize a 3D concept? By contrast, 3D rotors do not require the use of a fourth dimension of space in order to be visualized. Trying to visualize quaternions as operating in 4D just to explain 3D rotations is a bit like trying to understand planetary motion from an Earth-centric perspective, which becomes overly complex because you are looking at it from the wrong viewpoint. It would be great if we could start phasing out the use and teaching of quaternions and replace them with rotors. The change is simple and the code remains almost the same, but the understanding grows a lot. As a side note, geometric algebra contains more than just rotors and is a very useful tool to have in one's toolbox. By the way, there is an associated article to this video if you prefer. It also contains every interactive diagram that will be shown here. In 3D, we usually think of rotations as happening around an axis, like a wheel turning around its axle. But instead of thinking about the axle, a more correct way is to think about the plane that the wheel lies on perpendicular to the axle. This is because if we split a vector into two pieces, one lying inside the plane and one lying outside the plane, the rotation rotates the inside part while keeping the outside part the same. In 2D, there is only a single plane to rotate in. There is no outside part. Therefore, considering rotations to happen around the third axis perpendicular to the 2D plane is technically incorrect, since we shouldn't need to introduce another dimension to perform rotations. In addition, when thinking about rotation around an axis, the sense of rotation is undefined and so needs to be defined by convention, via the so-called right-hand rule. However, if we think about rotations as happening inside planes, the sense of rotation is clear. Rotation in the xy plane means a rotation that takes the vector x to the vector y, inside the plane and form together. Rotation in the yx plane is the opposite rotation, it takes the vector y to the vector x. To compute the axis of rotation to rotate one vector a to another vector b, we take the cross product of the two vectors to get a vector that is perpendicular to both. But why leave the plane since the rotation is fundamentally a 2D thing? Instead, we take what is called the outer product of the two vectors, building a new element called a bivector that represents the plane the two vectors form together. If the cross product creates the normal vector to a plane, the outer product creates the plane itself. Taking the normal to the plane is extraneous. The bivector b can be represented as the parallelogram built from the vectors a and b in the plane they form together. The idea of a bivector might seem strange at first, but they are pretty much as fundamental as vectors. If a vector is like a line, then the bivector is like a plane. Bivectors have components, just like vectors, but they are defined in terms of basis planes instead of basis lines like vectors. The three orthogonal basis planes are xy, xz, and yz. But first, let's look at the simpler 2D case. In 2D, there is only one plane, the xy plane. So a 2D bivector only has one component. For a bivector built from vectors a and b, this number is equal to the signed area of the parallelogram the two vectors form together. 
You can see that by changing the angle between the vectors, the area of the parallelogram changes, according to the sine of the angle. If the vectors are the same, or if they are parallel, they don't form a proper plane, and the result is zero. This simple property defines what a bivector is. By looking at the sum of two vectors, we can see that this property implies the following. We just need to expand the product and delete the terms that square to zero. A outer B is equal to minus B outer A. Just like the sense of a rotation matters, the order of the arguments to the outer product matters. Swapping arguments changes the sign of the result. This is called anti-symmetric. Here, the sign is representing using the color, which changes from blue to green. The sign changes whenever the rotation from A to B goes from being clockwise to being anti-clockwise. That is, if it matches the x to y direction or the y to x direction. The properties of the outer product are suited to capture the properties of planes and rotations. The vectors obviously don't have to be unit lengths, and here the restriction is removed. The signed area of the parallelogram is proportional to the lengths of both vectors. So for example, doubling the length of one vector doubles the area. We can get the actual value by plugging in the vectors in component form. We just need to expand the product and delete the terms that square to zero. Just like the coordinates of a vector v can be thought of as the projections of the vector onto the three orthogonal basis axes, coordinates of a bivector b can be thought of as the projection of the small plane onto the three orthogonal basis planes. The projections of the vector are the length of that vector along each basis vector, while the projection of the bivector are the areas of the plane on each basis plane. You can play with this diagram in the linked article. Using the same method as before, we find that the actual values of the components look a lot like the xy component from the 2D case, but applied to all three planes. In 3D, the definition of the outer product is very similar to that of the cross product. In fact, in 3D, a vector that comes from a cross product, such as a normal vector, will have three components which are equal to the components of the bivector. The numbers are the same, but the basis is different. The bivector definition makes sense geometrically instead of appearing out of thin air. I remember thinking when I was learning the cross product, why the hell does it return a vector that has length equal to the area of the parallelogram formed by the two vectors. That feels so arbitrary. In 3D, a bivector has three coordinates, one per plane. Vectors also have three coordinates, one per axis. Each plane is perpendicular to one axis. This is a coincidence that only happens in three dimensions, and it is why, historically, we have been confusing bivectors with vectors. Here's an example. You might have seen how normal vectors transform differently than regular vectors, using the inverse transpose of the matrix instead of the matrix itself. That's because they are not really vectors, but actually bivectors, which we have typecast to vectors. In physics, there's a hack called an axial vector, which has been introduced to differentiate vectors that come from cross product from regular vectors. Bivector is the actual type of the object, and it should be thought of and manipulated as such. We can keep taking the outer product to build not just oriented 2D areas, but oriented 3D volumes as well. A trivector T can be built by taking the outer product twice. In 3D, it stops there. Just like in 2D, there's only one plane which fills all of 2D space. In 3D, there's only one volume which fills all of 3D space. In 3D, a trivector only has one basis component, equal to the volume of the parallel pipette generated by the three vectors. The triple outer product is a better version of the scalar triple product, because it only involves one kind of operation, returns the correct type, volume instead of scalar, and works in any number of dimensions. The geometric product, denoted without a symbol, is another operation we can do on vectors. The geometric product is defined to have nice properties like associativity, and so that vectors have inverses. That is, a times a inverse equals 1, where 1 is just a number 1, 
The goal is to be able to multiply vectors together so that, just like for matrices, multiplication corresponds to geometric operations. To define the product, first note that it is possible to split a product, or any function that takes two arguments, into the sum of a part that does not change if we swap the arguments, and one that does change. The first term does not depend on the order of the arguments a and b anymore, it is called the symmetric part, while the second term changes sign when the arguments are swapped, it is called the anti-symmetric part. The dot product of two vectors is symmetric and the measure of distance, so it sounds useful geometrically to set it equal to the symmetric part. Similarly, the outer product of two vectors is anti-symmetric, so it sounds useful geometrically to set it equal to the anti-symmetric part. In addition, the dot product contains the cosine of the angle between the two vectors, while the outer product contains the sine of the angle. Together, they fully describe the angle between the two vectors, as well as the plane they form. So the geometric product is the following. It is strange because multiplying two vectors together gives the sum of two different things, a scalar and a bivector. However, this is similar to how a complex number is the sum of a scalar and an imaginary number, so you might be used to it already. Here, the bivector part corresponds to the imaginary part of the complex number, except it's not imaginary, it's just a bivector, which we have a concrete picture of. Basically, by multiplying two vectors together, we compute useful properties about them, such as the length of their projection onto each other, or the cosine of the angle, and the plane they form together, and the sine of the angle. We keep these bundled together via the plus sign. The geometric product also gives these property bundles operations that can be applied to them. And these operations have geometric interpretations, for example, rotating and reflecting vectors. The multiplication table helps make this product more concrete. Let's see what happens if we take products of the basis vectors. For any basis vector, such as the x-axis, the result is 1. For any pair of basis vectors, such as the x and y axes, the result is just the bivector they form together. This gives the following table. It's basically trivial, unlike the quaternion table, for example. If we have a unit vector a and a vector v, we can reflect v by the plane perpendicular to a. This is done the usual way. We decompose v into a part perpendicular to the plane and a part parallel to the plane. Then, to reflect the vector, flip the perpendicular part while keeping the parallel part unchanged. At this point, we can replace the dot product by its geometric product version to get the following. For this step, the geometric product of A with itself is just a dot product since the exterior product is zero. This is saying the exact same thing, but in a different notation, using a simple product notation instead of a formula to encode a fundamental operation such as a reflection is going to prove very useful. It turns out that if we apply two successive reflections to V using vector A followed by vector B, we get a rotation by twice the angle between the vectors A and B. You can play with this diagram in a linked article. In the 3D case, the vector v can be split into two different parts, one lying inside the plane, defined by a and b, and one lying outside the plane. As seen here, when the vector gets reflected by each plane, its outside part stays the same, 
So for the inside part, we are back to the 2D case and it just gets rotated by twice the angle. In terms of the geometric product, the two reflections simply correspond to the following. We call AB a rotor because multiplying by AB on both sides of a vector performs a rotation. Applying a rotor AB to both sides of a vector rotates this vector in the plane of vectors A and B by twice the angle between A and B. And that's all there is to it. We can notice that 3D rotors look a lot like quaternions. However, as we have seen, 3D rotors are a 3D concept that does not require the use of 4D double rotations or stereographic projections to visualize. Trying to visualize quaternions as operating in 4D just to explain 3D rotations is a bit like trying to understand planetary motion from an Earth-centric perspective. That is, it will be overly complex because you are looking at it from the wrong viewpoint. As we have seen, representing rotations as operating inside planes instead of around vectors helps a lot. For example, the basis by vector squared or negative one, just like the basis quaternions. Multiplying two bivectors together gives a third bivector, but this is basically trivial, and we don't have to remember how i times j equals k. These properties are a consequence of the geometric product instead of appearing out of thin air. And that's it. Like I said, if you want to play with any of the diagrams shown in this video, or if you want to read a written version, you can go to the following link.